Two stars. Fuck. <laughs> then I'll tell you whether we have the same purpose or not. <laughs> <laughs> In the name of God, the compassion, the merciful. First, I am grateful to God for giving me the blessing of being here, and especially this. Uh, additional gift of meeting you because I thought I only meet uh, people in our class but this is very good that I have opportunity to meet all of you uh, in response to your question first of all I think dialogue doesn't need purpose I think dialogue is the most natural thing for human beings and if we don't talk to each other it means that we are missing part of our humanity so we should always be open for dialogue when it comes to people with whom you think you have more differences this is the time that you actually need more dialogue to make sure that first of all are these differences real differences or you think you have differences many times because we have not expressed ourselves or we have not listened properly to the other person we think we have differences but later we realize that we don't have differences but even if there are differences differences should not stop us having dialogue it should give us a more momentum for dialogue I think the people who believe in God they should be feeling that they have a responsibility towards all people, all creation of God. I should do my best to serve others, to benefit others, because they are creatures of my God, and God's signatories on all of them I cannot do justice to this job without knowing them without talking and listening to them so I think we should have dialogue even I believe we should have dialogue with non-human beings I think even when we go to a park or jungle or river or next to a sea we should have some kind of dialogue with nature we should empty ourselves and let them speak to us. And we should also try to understand them and speak to them in the way that benefits them. Many things that we do with respect to environment shows that we don't have any channel of understanding between us. We are not able to show our care and love. So this is the general picture, but when it comes to Christian Muslim dialogue which is my own uh, focus and my own priority I am happy just before this I was telling that we should be happy with all kinds of dialogue and you can never say because for example dialogue with this particular group is very important for me I don't want to have dialogue with others that's wrong you should be always open to dialogue with anyone but because our time is limited and also dialogue when it becomes serious needs some kind of expertise some kind of you know experience so you can prioritize I have prioritized for myself dialogue with Christians because I think this is what is going to shape the future of humanity and this is what I understand from the Quran that in the end of time Muslims and Christians have great responsibility and especially when we see that in our scriptures in you know, many uh, hadith we have the idea that uh, Jesus would come with Imam Mahdi which is the 12th Imam so I say what does it mean why among all as a Muslim you as a Christian may look at it in a different perspective but as a Muslim it's a question for me why Jesus there were 124,000 prophets. 
why Jesus comes and why he and our Imam would be together. Doesn't this give us an indication that we should try to prepare for that by bringing these communities closer to each other so that then they can meet at that high level? You know, if today they tell me that the greatest, for example, Christian leader and the greatest Muslim leader in the world, they share office. I cannot accept that. I say, no, this is too good to believe. How can these two work and, you know, be in the same office? So, if the world is going to remain like what is today, we can never make sense why Jesus and Imam Mahdi come together and say prayer together. Okay? So, it means that we should move to that direction. So, therefore, my purpose of dialogue with Christians, which is my special, you know, interest and priority, is to bring Muslims and Christians closer. And I think them coming closer is actually coming closer to God. There is no way that think that God wants us to be divided, or there is no way to think that you are really moving towards God and you are separated. If we come closer, it means we are coming closer to God. If we are closer to God, it means we come closer to each other. These two come together. So this is my main uh, interest. And I think that world also is showing us that this more and more is needed. 20 years ago, I didn't perhaps feel the world is that desperate that is today. Today we really need this. And who knows, maybe even future becomes worse. So we have to work hard and before we lose lots of opportunities, we form serious fellowship between Christians and Muslims who are really sincere, open, humble, through thinking, and they don't have any agenda. They don't want to promote their own religion or their own you know, denomination. They are not after anything worldly. They just want to serve anyone who is moving towards God. So this is my understanding. Um, and whether we agree, I mean, agree with everything uh, he said. Uh, I want to, if you want my way of saying some of these things, I refer you to a paper that I wrote just a couple months ago uh, on Mennonite Shia engagement and what it's all about. I have some extra copies, which uh, if any of you want a copy of that, you may pick them up. I don't have enough for all of you, uh, but feel free to pick that up. And I found it interesting the way you began because I say in this paper somewhere, I was looking for it and couldn't find it, you know how it is, you write a big paper and then you can't find what you really want to say uh, or want to, what you're looking for. <clears throat> but I say uh, in this paper that for human beings, as we understand ourselves under God, dialogue doesn't need any justification. It is just, what needs justification is not dialogue. If you're going to, if you're not going to talk with other people, you have to explain why. When you're talking to other people, that's just as normal as it can be. That's what people who confess a common parent God do with one another. We're children. We communicate. We commune uh, with one another. That's the, uh, the one thing. The other thing that I would emphasize uh, here, which is, I think, very much in keeping with what you have just said is that I, ta I take this form of dialogue as a form of peacemaking or peace building. Um, as Dr. Shamali said, uh, we live in a particular world and especially with respect to the country, the nation of Ara Iran, where the powers <clears throat> around us are trying to define us as enemies. Right? I mean, uh, we, we are not, I mean, our, if you go to our, the website, um, the diplomatic website in the Canadian uh, embassy portion, and you look for a visa to go to Iran, the first thing you will see is that it is not recommended to travel to Iran. You shouldn't go there. Those are not our friends. And there are no diplomatic relations between Canada and Iran or between U.S. and Iran. And so they make it difficult for us to get visas. I mean, 
uh, it, it, normally when you get a visa, want to get a visa to go travel to another country, you go to the embassy of that country in your country, and then you apply for a visa. You can't do that here. You have to go elsewhere. And so that makes it very difficult. And especially in a context when the powers out there, and it's not just the nations, it's the rhetoric of the larger public that wants to keep us from interrelating, those of us who believe in God and submit ourselves to the will of God, who wants to unite all of humanity, we have to stand up and say, no, we can't. We can't not dialogue with people from that region of the world. It is an act of peacemaking to do that. And it's, it may, in, in an occasion, it's actually quite uh, not only difficult, but sort of costly. In this, when I, I have a passport in which I've been to Iran now, I think I have three visas, Iranian visas, and they're big, full-page visas, and they stand out in the passport. When I go to the US, they don't like this at all. Like, they, I mean, I try not to travel to the US, because they say, why are you going to Iran? It's not a friendly country. This is dangerous. What are you doing? Like, terrorism and all that kind of stuff. And so I think we need to find ways of, of crossing uh, those kinds of, uh, of tensions with a simple act of dialogue. We just want to talk. We want to talk about our common faith. We want to share our, our spirituality. So those are uh, a few things uh, that, um, that I would add to uh, the comments that Dr. Shinali made. So we have one or two more questions, and if our answers are this long, then uh, we're done. I'm wondering if in your dialogue you learned anything about your own religion that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise known or caused you to change the way you looked at your own faith, and if you could give an example of what that might be. Hmm. The, the way this dialogue has affected my understanding of my own religion. Yeah. No, when you go for dialogue, or even when you are studying on your own or thinking, I think we should always be seeking guidance from God and better understanding. When I go for dialogue, I shouldn't say that I go to dialogue, but I would be very careful not to accept anything. I'm just going to say and you know explain my own ideas. And you cannot also say I'm going to dialogue and I'm going to accept everything or 50% of the things. I think dialogue is part of our life. I don't see my life in dialogue or outside dialogue partitioned. So, I, as a person who is always trying to be a seeker of knowledge, a seeker of truth, I look at dialogue as one of different opportunities that I have in my life to ask God for improving my understanding. So I see this as supplementary to my reading of Muslim scholars, my reading of my scripture, my contemplation, it's a supplementary. If I come to a better understanding, whether it be through reading a Muslim scholar or Christian scholar or even an atheist, I shouldn't mind. Because what is important is not who is saying this, it is what is said. So, this is my general view. But to my own experience, I cannot say I would not have had the same understanding that I have today of Islam if I had no dialogue. I cannot say definitely, because maybe God had other ways to bring me to this position. 
But at the same time, I can say that I see I have been very enriched with this dialogue. And even some of my understandings of the Quran, which even person without dialogue experience can have the same understanding, but maybe I could not have had it without this experience. So it's very, uh, I think, enriching experience if you really give your heart to it. If you are, of course, confident, if you are, you know, established, you know, your own faith. But at the same time, you are open and you seek understanding. So I think I have benefited a lot. And I have also mentioned, you know, in the morning that uh, sometimes even the things that which are maybe very obvious in your own tradition, you need someone else to remind you. You need someone else to bring it to your attention. And there are many things also that you don't know about your own tradition. In discussions, you know, they come up. So I think I am very grateful to God for the opportunities that I had for dialogue. And I think they have been very helpful for me, very helpful. In, uh, <clears throat> in saying very much the same thing, I would come at it perhaps a little, little differently. Um, everything that I know, which is not very much, uh, really has come out of a dialogic engagement of some kind. I mean, I was obviously in dialogue with my parents who taught me a lot. Uh, then I went to school and there was dialogue between teacher and students and that taught me a lot. Then I learned how to read and I started reading books and I was in dialogue with the authors and I learned an awful lot. And on and on and on. When you go through university, basically this is a form of ongoing dialogue, which means an interchange or an interaction of of ideas and of people's lives and uh, those kinds of things. You learn not only by encountering ideas, you also learn a lot about countering the life of another person. Um, I mean, if I think of not, have, not having engaged in this dialogue, I mean, I am not first of all saddened by the fact that I may not have had the opportunity of listening to a whole bunch of papers that were presented, but I, I would be deeply saddened for not having had the opportunity of having a friendship with Dr. Shamali. I mean, learning has not just got to do with changing your mind, it's got to do also with changing your heart. It's got to do with changing uh, your, your encounter with another person. You're, in a sense, your love of another and your love of God changes in that and it's very difficult I mean it's it's cute to say very simplistic things like and, and it is true that I have a deep respect for the spiritual life of my Shia friends their prayer life for example I mean that's but that's a kind of an obvious thing for me I mean it's 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 just it's you, you open yourself to an encounter with another person you see this is how they practice their spirituality well, and if you respond as a, well, that's their thing, I don't care. I mean, that's, that's not genuine encounter. Genuine encounter always involves a form uh, of learning. But that learning is not simply and easily quantified. Uh, and we, sh and should we, we should be careful. We should be careful that we don't run too quickly to say, oh, here's what I've learned. I've done with that learning. Now I go on to something else. You know... I, we, when I narrated the, uh, the, 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 the origins of this dialogue, who would have thought that a response to an earthquake might give rise to what we have today in terms of our relationship? And that was only possible because there was mutual openness <coughs> to learning and to encounter uh, in ways that, I mean, for me, have been surprising altogether. You know, my very first time to Combe, I thought would be my last time. Now, I've been back, I don't know, 10 times or something like that. Um, now, I always sort of think, well, I 
probably won't get back there very often again, but it just happens. And you're open to things, and you, you only learn in openness. Uh, you, you, when you read a book, you don't say at the beginning of this book, I'm not going to let this book teach me anything. I mean, why would you read a book? Or why would you encounter another person? And so unless you do that, uh, you're not going to learn much, but then you wouldn't do it if you were not willing. And if you do that, if you enter that relationship in openness, it'll change you beyond recognition sometimes. My friends sometimes say, you're not going to become a Muslim, though, are you? <laughs> I, I've never, ever thought of that. I mean, I really haven't. That's not it, but I am open to learning whatever I can. Sorry. So what's the process of a dialogue? Do you, uh, or the structure? If I want to go to a dialogue, what will I experience? What, or do you have set questions? How does it work? We assign topics to uh -huh. people, to professors, and they develop papers, academic papers, they read those papers, and then there's discussion, and then another person from the other side reads a paper on a similar topic, and then there's further discussion, and then there's engagement. But in many ways, that's not all that happens. A lot of the time, what happens isn't on the program. <laughs> and that's the forming of friendships, you know, where, you know, where emails come. Um, from Dr. Shamali to me, we, we have a situation here, would you, would you pray for us? That has happened. Uh, I mean, we become friends, and when, fr when you become friends, you enter into a kind of a common spirituality. Um, and so, that's not on the program. <laughs> and so, but those things happen. So, can you give an example of a topic, for example, that, I, that you might have presented at Uh Yes, in fact, I think I... Um, yeah. you, you said you talk, and I'll yeah. actually show you. Go ahead. Modernity and revelation. Yeah. And well, I read those topics, but you mean more specific topics, right? Yeah. Okay. So Why don't you talk in response to some of these things? I'm yeah. show you something. I'll show you the program. Okay. I think. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so what what we have is we have kind of a structured dialogue. Like, for example, so far we have had six rounds of Shia Mennonite dialogue. But these are structured. These are when a good number of people come together. For example, six, seven, eight from each side. They have papers and presentation. But in between, we have lots of exchange. OK? So maybe. In these years, in addition to this, for example, six, at least I have 60 either trips or you know, uh, meetings with my Mennonite friends in different countries. You know? And every time there is something. And actually, sometimes you know, we try to think of creating opportunities. So for example, I say to Harry, uh, how, how do you see the possibility of me bringing a group of 10 12 women from seminary here. We brought two wise, you know, seminary women to here. Or, for example, you know, there is a summer school, so we uh, encourage our people to come here. Or we have courses there, we invite Harry, for example, to come there. Or now we are planning, for example, something to do in London together. So basically, we think this is our friendship is a very important asset. So we should appreciate, but we should try also to enrich it and, you know, make it grow. And when we do work together, it grows. So you shouldn't keep it only between, you know, you, yourself, you know, and uh, be shy about it. You should bring this good news outside. So now, for example, about Catholic Shia dialogue. So we have had seven rounds of Catholic Shia dialogue, but the major ones. Otherwise, maybe I had 200 uh, different encounters with Catholics, okay? So we have published six books. And last February, Abbot Timothy and I received a award from Iran's president in Book of the Year Award for our work on dialogue. Now, for the first time, uh, we had a suggestion from our Catholic friends, and we welcomed, that we go to Kenya. 
So far we have it only had it only Italy, UK, Iran. Now we are going to Kenya because there there are some problems in Africa between some Muslims and Christians. So we want to take this news there and involve local also Muslims and Christians there and help in uh, you know so you can do lots of things you know uh, through this uh, dialogue but our hope is that in future we would be able also to do some humanitarian work together also because that is also something that if we do it together would be I think more blessed it's a very specific example of what's on our program for this coming Dialogue 7, if it happens, uh, is it's on youth and religion, that's the general topic, and then we have several subtopics, for example, the moral crisis, like why, what's happening out there, the identity crisis, what's happening, why, the, uh, one, one section is called the antipathy towards religion, that's another uh, section, and then uh, we have something on youth and spirituality, those are subtopics, and each one Muslim, one Christian responds to each of those topics. So those are specific examples. And then in, in, uh, we also have a lots of discussion involving, in this case, involving youth who will be bringing questions so that there can be interaction between the senior professors and the youth. There was a hand here, I think. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, kind of on a similar vein. So taking your work that comes from these dialogues, how do you then into your respective communities and kind of build on the work that um, like 10 or 15 academics are doing and then have that, I guess, kind of live its life within their own communities, does that make sense? I'm wondering what that is. So uh, one of the things we have been committed to do was first we try to have publications because the publication documents this dialogue for other people. And there have been people then who have done research or even dissertation on these you know, uh, publications. The second thing is that from the beginning, we try to involve also graduate students. So it's not just some professors. Some graduate students are also witnessing and observing and this is very important because, for example, I myself, uh, when I was a student, I didn't have that much opportunity to witness these things, you know, uh, myself. But uh, we thought before our students, we should, you know, make this possible for them. Uh, either inviting our Christian friends to come or arranging for them to come here, being part of the dialogue, being part of the course. Uh, for example, when we started a new institute in Com uh, about, now it is eight years ago, so uh, I sent all my deputies, except the one for finance, which is not a cleric, to EMU for SPI. Uh, uh, one of them also did a second uh, master degree there. Then I try to send other people. Then we try to send our students here. So now it's several years our students come here, plus two groups of ladies that we brought in. Also, Harry has brought students uh, and also uh, professors and you know different people. Harry, Ed, Martin, and you know. So we have had lots of opportunity to engage other people. So it that is, it would not be something only for few people. And now. We are also trying to have workshops on interfaith. So this year, uh, we started to have some workshops, and you know, with Esra also is involved. For example, we had in Switzerland in March, 18 people from Canada, UK, US. You know, in uh, July, sorry, in August, we are going to have 20 Catholic Shia, uh, Catholic youths and 20 Shia youths in Italy for program. So we try not to keep it only for the academia. To have something that academia can reflect on, but also to bring it to the students, to the community, activist members, and 
I am now, for example, trying to, inshallah, God willing, to have in major cities in the English speaking in our community, have few people who are trained for interfaith dialogue. And always we try then to put them in touch with our Christian friends there so that they keep in touch. So it's a long journey, but it's very um, rewarding. A few things in addition to that. Um, here at this institution, once you get students you know, that have experience in this, this happens uh, to filtrate into the student body with chapels on this topic and uh, whatever classroom discussions on this topic. Uh, we relate to the local uh, Muslim community in Winnipeg. There have been, um, I think as a result of some of these kinds of discussion, there have been efforts to have, um, uh, you know, Christian Muslim dialogue in, in the city. Dr. Shamali and I have been asked uh, this coming October to do some itinerating in, um, in Alberta. This is a, there's an organization there that's Mennonite and Muslim together have asked the two of us to come and visit churches, universities, mosques, and, and other places to speak about what it is that we're doing. Um, some of the ventures that we sponsor here are pu publicly funded uh, ventures, uh, research grants, uh, Canada Council research grant, uh, in one case, now in this in this particular case, uh, Department of Heritage, uh, Government of Canada grant, and I only write I say that because that commits us to kind of the the public dissemination of what it is that we do. So it's very much not a matter of um, you know keeping this among ourselves, but it's the dissemination is a very important uh, aspect of this program. Shamali, I found it uh, intriguing that you said dialogue with non-humans is important. Um, I think you had said it like it's an emptying out of, of oneself in, in that dialogue. Can you offer any um, maybe practical um, approaches to that type of dialogue? Like, what would that look like? Um, what would that mean? You know, unfortunately, we many times take things for granted. Uh, when, for example, you know, there is a tray of fruits, you know, we many times think just this is something, you know, for me to eat and fail to notice the beauties that God has put in each of these fruits. You know, when we look at a painting, you try to spend some time because you know a human being has spent some time on this. For example, maybe it's taken him a few weeks or a few months to make this painting, and it would be very, you know, cruel for me or you know, uh, bad that I don't pay any attention. But unfortunately, when it comes to the creation of God, you know, we take it for granted. We read that, for example, you know, some mystics, uh, when they looked at a rose flower, they used to cry. It was, you know, so overwhelming to see the beauty that comes from this, this manifestation of God. So we should go to the external world around us with a new outlook to be able to acknowledge the beauty that they have to be able to acknowledge the good that they give to us and be as respectful as possible to them and if we are going to somehow benefit from them we should keep it to the minimum and in a very responsible way so much so that we don't disturb their order okay so, for example, if there are few trees and I want to take, you know, some fruits, I shouldn't take all from one tree. Take from each so that still they, each of them has some fruits, you know. So we have to be very careful about the way we treat nature. 
Sometimes we just look at everything as, you know, bulk of things, you know, that have no spirit, no life, no understanding. And, you know, just I can deal with them in the way that I like. This is not good. the obstacles to this form of interfaith dialogue is relates to some of the things that I said before and that is the, the, the powers that try to keep this from happening uh, and those are both the sort of the formal structures uh, like visas and things like that but also the in, in 2005, I think it was in 2005. Were you at Congregate of Waterloo? Yeah. The, the spirituality one. And um, I want to identify that because uh, that was a very difficult uh, event because the um, there's a group of former Iranians and other people from Toronto who protested this kind of happening. And I'm not, I'm not targeting uh, Iranians necessarily, but the, you know, they did not believe that we should be giving voice to this group of people, the Iranian clerics, that we were doing. And so they were, it was a very, very, uh, at least verbally violent protest, which involved, um, you know, the, the police squad, the riot squads from Toronto perched on the roofs of uh, Connor River College buildings. and. It was horrible. Uh, we, we, we walked through, you know, careful corridors, little, felt a bit like cattle, um, and we were herded into the room, and then when, once we were in the room, the whole thing was shouted down, and we couldn't have our dialogue. I mean, and, 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 and I only tell that story, I mean, it's a dramatic story, but I tell that because there are voices around that say, we shouldn't be doing this. Be why? Because you're speaking with the enemy. And, and, and that might go in all kinds of directions. We don't know where all that comes from. And certainly there are a lot of Christian voices who say that we as Christians are speaking uh, with the enemy. I, I get that a lot. We have consequently not, when the first time we held this dialogue at CMU, we, we held it under the public radar. We made no announcements uh, so that the media didn't know, nobody knew we were doing this. And we were very careful to make sure that we had security protection. It was not necessary, but we have, and I think over the years, cultivated very good relationships with the media, with other people here, so that now the event that we are planning for next week is a completely public event. It's completely open. Everybody is invited to attend, and I wouldn't expect us to have any difficulty with that. That's one example of um, some of the uh, the obstacles or the impediments uh, in place and how we had worked at uh, overcome. Just one example. Go ahead. Um, I've observed quite a few interfaith dialogues and I've worked internationally yes. um, in a Christian Muslim context. And I'm curious from your perspective on the inside, after you've been together for so many meetings and you've been together informally for a, a long period of what do you see that could destabilize what you've now established? Because, I mean, it's actually, it's quite an intimate question, obviously. But what could cause it to? What could cause you and the other key leaders in this to destabilize your relationships kind of internally and internally? And what do you see in interfaith dialogues that have gone on for a long period of time? Um, what kind of things threaten it? I'm not, yeah, that's I an interesting it's question. Great, it's that's not, I'm not sure I've thought of that so very much. Uh, uh, maybe you want to start with that. I, um, that's new to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. 
I think this is somehow irreversible. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes it work maybe is the flip side of the question, right? Yeah. So I I don't think of, uh, we can never go back to what was the zero station. But uh, what the, you know the challenges that are, you also ask. I think. One challenge is people from your own tradition would misjudge you sometimes. And they think that you have uh, diluted your faith, you have compromised. Or, for example, as soon as you want to meet someone, you know, some people say, oh, you, you have accepted what they say, you know, you have endorsed with them. Uh, not knowing that. Of course, dialogue between Muslim and Christian is a very close dialogue inside the family. But even, for example, with someone that I don't have anything in common, I shouldn't have a problem in dialogue. Dialogue doesn't mean that I have accepted what the other person is doing or saying or behaving. Dialogue is a way to see, can I make a better sense of what they do and what they think? So perhaps then we can work together to move to a better situation. But some people have this, unfortunately, idea that if you dialogue with someone, it means that you are approving what they are doing and they are doing wrong and you know, all these things. The other challenge is, at least I can say for me, is that I, I have not been receiving clear, practical, theological instructions for dialogue. Up to some level, it is there. But now we, are, we have reached a point that it's like you know, cutting the edge. So every time we come up with questions, we have to work hard theologically and spiritually to find out what's the next step. And many times you don't know even if there is the next step or not, you know. So you, you cannot say definitely there is something to come. Maybe nothing is going, but you hope. So what we are trying to say, you know, okay, it has taken us so many years to reach here. So other people shouldn't, you know, spend so much time. We can share with them what we have achieved. And thanks to God, it works very quickly. It's like an ocean or a lake that you create over years, but then you can invite other people to quickly dive into that ocean. But now you are always thinking, is there any way I can make this lake better, you know, grow or not? There is no manual for that, you know, when you reach that level. For the beginning, there is manual. Okay, you want to uh, have a session, you should observe these things. But later, it reaches the point that there is no manual. So this is where actually you become then more uh, perhaps prayerful, more demanding, you know, uh, humbleness before God for guidance. Of course, none of that means that things are going to remain the way they have been for the next 15, 20 years. I mean, if they do, they'll die. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to find their own new life, their new forms. New people are constantly becoming involved in this, and uh, and they have new ideas, and uh, so this will take new shape. Yes. Um, on a slightly different vein, you admit you made the comment earlier, which I like that that uh, dialogue in itself is a form of peace building, peace building making. Um, I was noting that the name of the class is Peace Resources in Islam and Christianity. Is there in the conversations that you have, are, how is that coming out in terms of like, what are the, the sh are, we are you looking at shared resources of theological resources for peace or uh, spiritual resources, strategic, um, you know, think, think about, I'm just curious about how that comes back. Mm -hmm. so. I, actually, I think it's all of them. Uh, certainly theological and spiritual resources and strategic resources, I mean, okay. Um, I mean, uh, 
asking the question all the time, like, what, what, what can enhance the engagement with, with, with two different faith representatives or groups of two different faith representatives in a respectful and an upbuilding manner under God, under a kind of recognition that we are, we are serving one God. I mean, so that's the framework under which I think we want to work at resources, and that's theological and strategic, philosophical, practical, and all of those kinds of things. So maybe you want. To. Yeah. We are out of time. I think we had an hour, right? Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. A wonderful class to do this with the whole week. Yeah. Very, very engaging. So